So this video is a continuation of my relativity series. It is called Quantifying Relativity. Now, how does one go about quantifying relativity? Well, here's what I plan on doing. Okay, I'm going to quantify relativity by number one, listing all the ways that objects can move relative to each other. And then I'm going to write all the relativistic and Doppler equations, the correction equations that are associated with each case. This idea actually comes from the work of Robert Distinti. Now what Robert Distinti did was he listed all the ways that charges can move relative to each other. Okay, and he wrote the force equations associated with each case. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of here. Hopefully, if I remember, I will put a link to this video uh, in the description. But um, this was actually a very good idea. I thought it was a good idea when he did it. And so I'm going to use this approach uh, to quantify relativity. So here are all the ways that I could think of that um, objects can move relative to each other. Now the first case is trivial. The first case would be, um, so the circle um, in my schematic here is an object that is not moving and an arrow is an object that is moving. So the trivial case is uh, two objects near each other that are not moving. Um, so the next case would be one object moving and one object moving, or one object not moving and one object moving towards it and this is one object not moving and an object moving away from it. Here we have two objects moving towards each other. Here we have two objects moving away from each other. Here we have two objects that are moving in parallel motion. And here we have two objects that are moving past each other. And uh, here we have uh, an object not moving and um, another object moving transversely past it. And we have these two additional cases. We have the case where we have an object that is not in motion and another object is in circular motion around it. And then we have one more case where um, we have two objects that are in a circular motion around a common point. And so this one would be both objects in motion and this one would be one object that is not in motion and another object in circular motion uh, around it. So these are all the cases I could think of. There might be more, but these are the ones that are most obvious that we maybe will run into uh, on a daily basis that we might want to um, do calculations on. And so these are all the cases I could think of. We're gonna deal with some of these cases today, maybe not all of them, just to keep the video um, at a reasonable length, but I'm going to show you how to um, quantify relativity in each of these cases. So the next thing that I did was I wrote all of the equations I could think of that are related to relativity and the Doppler effect. And so this is what I came up with. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six equations. Each equation deals with a particular scenario and I will get into this um, as we move forward. But I just wanted to show you that I've quantified each, equa each equation that I think we need to, um, to be able to uh, correct for Doppler shift in, uh, in frequency and the relativistic effect. So these two equations are the relativity equations and these four equations deal with the Doppler effect. And this code here, I will explain, um, I will explain shortly, but I want to get through a few more cases first and then we'll talk about what these codes mean. So the first case is trivial. Like I said before, you've got two objects that are not in motion relative, relative to each other. They are sitting still next to each other. And so there's going to be no Doppler shift and there's not going to be any relativistic effect as well, other than gravitational effects, which we, which we are not talking about in this um, presentation. So you can assume that these two objects are out in space, far away from any gravitational field. We're only talking about relative motion between various objects. So this case is relatively trivial, pun intended. 
Okay, this is this is the case that I showed you in uh, my previous video, and this is the case where you have uh, an observer uh, in the middle and a source moving around um, a, a, a central observer, or we have the observer is in motion and the source is not moving. Okay, so we dealt with this last time, and so let's have a closer look at this simple uh, schematic, we've got an object not in motion, an object in stillness, and we have an object in, in circular motion around this object. In this case, there is no Doppler shift. There is no Doppler shift because, um, because the distance between these objects is technically not changing. There, it, this object on the right here is not moving away from and towards this object in the center, and so there's no, no Doppler shift. But there is a relativistic Doppler shift because one of these um, one of these objects is in motion, and this is the object in motion. So from the perspective of this object here, okay, and this is what we saw last time. So the if the observer is in the middle, if the observer is in the middle, they are going to see a relativistic red shift. They are going to see a relativistic red shift, and they're going to need to use this formula here, this correction here. They're going to need to multiply with the frequency to get the corrected frequency. Okay, so that is a relativistic redshift. And um, the, per, the object that is in motion is going to see a relativistic blue shift. And this is the case that we saw here where the observer is now in motion and the source of the radiation is in is uh, at the center, not in motion. The uh, observer here is going to perceive a a relativistic blue shift. Okay, so this is analogous to this experiment from the paper I showed you in the in the uh, previous video, where you have a there is a um, radiation source which is in the middle here, and this is a centrifuge which is being spun. Uh, very quickly at tens of thousands of RPM. And this is the detector, this is the observer, this is the absorber, this is the detector, and the te detector is in motion. So when the detector is in motion, you have this case here, and you have a relativistic blue shift. And so in order for this person to get to coordinate its clock with the source in the middle, it needs to use this formula here, which is one over square root of one minus b squared over c squared. Okay, so if you're, if you're uh, not in motion and you're the observer in the middle, you use this correction. And when you're in motion and the source is in the middle, you use this correction. So uh, again, in this, uh, in this in schematic here, we have a non-moving uh, object in the middle and we have a moving object in circular motion around this object. From the perspective of the person that's not moving, they will be using the um, relativistic redshift equation, what I call RRS. So that's relativity, redshift, and the, the object that is in stillness. S stands for stillness, the object is not moving. So I use S to mean the still object. And so this is the correction that uh, this observer would have to use to correct for the relativistic, um, the clock retardation of this uh, object here that is in circular motion around it. And so, and again, there's no Doppler shift because this is not moving closer to or further away from this object, and so uh, the Doppler shift is non-existent. And so, uh, f but from the perspective of the, uh, the object in motion, from the perspective of the object in motion, uh, if it wants to correct its clocks relative to this guy here, it is going to have to use this formula. I call it RBM for relativity, blue shift, the object is in motion. I use M for motion. So that is how I'm uh, using this code. I'm a computer scientist. I like making up codes. And it helps me actually sort all this out. So these letters actually help me sort this out. So RRS is relativistic redshift for the object in stillness. And RBM is a relativistic blue shift for an object in motion. And this is the formula that the object in motion would use to correct for 
clock differences between it and the object that is not in motion. So next we're going to look at this case where we have an object that is not moving, an object in stillness, and we have an object that is moving towards this object. And so um, this object here is going to, um, because this object is not in motion and this object is in motion, this object is going to experience a relativistic redshift. Why? Because the object that is, is in motion is the one who's experiencing clock retardation. And so um, this object here that is, is, is experiencing clock retardation is sending its pulses to this guy over here much slower. And so this um, object here is going to see a relativistic red shift. But this person over this object over here is going to see a relativistic blue shift. And this is analogous to this situation here where we have the, when the observer is in motion, the observer, um, when the observer is in motion, this observer sees a blue shift of the, of the uh, source that's not in motion. Okay, so the object that's in motion actually sees a, uh, technically sees a blue shift. It's going to see an increase in pulses relative to what it's expecting. Now the person, this is a little harder to understand, but the object that's in motion is experiencing clock retardation. And so it's going to be getting pulses faster in faster from the object not in, mo in motion that isn't experiencing clock retardation. It's going to be getting receiving pulses faster than it expects. And so it is going to see a relativistic blue shift relative to what it's expecting. And so, um, so the non-moving um, object would be using the uh, relativistic redshift equation, which or would be correcting by using the relativistic redshift equation. RRS means relativity redshift for the object in stillness, okay? And the object in motion is going to be using RBM, the relativistic equation, f uh, which is a, technically a blue shift, for the object that is in motion. Now in terms of Doppler shift, that is a completely different story. In terms of a Doppler shift, actually both observers are going to see a blue shift. So this observer is going to see um, a blue shift because this uh, object is moving towards it, okay? But this object is going to see a blue shift if this was the source because this is moving towards the object. And so this is where the reciprocity, re reciprocity, I'm not sure if that's the right word, the reciprocal nature of um, two objects, one in motion and not in motion, comes in. Okay, I think this is a really important point that both of these objects see a Doppler blue shift. Uh, regardless of which one is in motion. And this is, I think, what people get confused with relativity. This is not relativity, this is just normal Doppler shift. Uh, both objects see each other as being blue shifted in terms of Doppler, um, but each object sees something different in terms of relativity. So this guy sees a relativity red shift, this guy sees a rel relativity blue shift, but they both see red shifts. Sorry, they both see blue shifts. Okay, whether what depend it doesn't matter which one is moving. This one is moving. This one's not moving. They both see a blue shift, and so I think this is. I'm pretty sure this is where most of the confusion is coming in regarding relativity. Um, they are confusing Doppler shift with relativistic shift. Okay, the only person that that shifts in relativity is the object that is moving. The object that is in motion relative to the ether. Okay, the speed of light here, this is the ether. The object that is in motion relative to the ether is going to experience clock retardation. The object that is not in motion relative to the ether is not going to experience clock retardation. And so, um, to, so for this uh, object here, to, for this object here to correct for, uh, or to coordinate its clocks with this observer here, it needs to use the 
relativistic redshift for an object in stillness, and the Doppler blue shift for an object in stillness. You correct the frequency by multiplying this by the frequency by this, and then multiplying by this, and you're going to get the right answer. Now the object in motion is going to have to use the RBM and the DBM equations. RBM, the relativistic blue shift for an object in motion, and the Doppler blue shift for an object in motion. And so when you multiply these two together and multiply by the frequency, you're going to get the frequency shift. You're going to get the new frequency that um, this person is going to see this person as. So if this uh, object here is the emitter, the uh, object in motion is going to have to apply these two corrections. Okay, and if the object is not moving and this uh, guy is the source, the object not in motion is going to have to use these two uh, corrections to correct for the motion of this object. Alternatively, and here's where it gets interesting, is um, either observer, either observer, because this they both experience a Doppler blue shift, either observer can use this equation, can use this correction to correct for each other. Okay, this is a little bit, this is why I really like, I like compressing things, I like um, simplifying these. You know, this guy here looks a little bit ugly, but this guy here looks a little bit ugly. But they are actually, in fact, uh, the correction factors are equivalent. Okay, so um, the correction that this guy has to use, although it looks different, although it looks different, actually equates to the same formula here. And this, uh, you know, this times this actually also equates to this formula here. So this is where uh, this is really nice. So this only works when you have an object moving towards the uh, another ob object that is not moving or away from, but this is a really nice, it's a really nice compression. If you know the object is moving towards you or you know the object is moving away from you, uh, you can use a formula that looks like this. Now this is the one, this is the one that you use for an object moving towards you. You C plus V, if you know the object's moving towards you, you put C plus V on top and you put C minus V on the bottom and you get the right answer. And each observer can use this formula. Or this observer can use this formula, or this observer can use this formula, or they could each use this formula and they're going to get the right answer. Okay, they're gonna get the right answer. So the V here is the velocity of the object in motion, and that's it. So in this next case, we have an object that is not moving and an object that is moving away from it. Okay, and so the object that is not in moving is going to see, uh, because the object on the right is in motion and the object on the left is not in motion, the object on the right is experiencing clock retardation. And so relative to the guy that's not in motion, the object in motion is going to um, seem like a relativistic redshift. It's going to, uh, from this observer, this observer is going to see a relativistic redshift. Uh, and because this object is moving away from this object, this object is also going to see a Doppler red shift. But from the perspective of the, uh, the moving object, uh, the moving object, again, I want to go back and reference this experiment where the object that was in motion was the one was experiencing a blue shift. It was reading a blue shift from the source in the middle. So an object that is in motion, an object that is in motion is going to perceive the object not in motion as blue shifted, okay? But because this object is moving away from this object, it is also going to perceive this object as red shifted. As, you know, uh, this object is moving away from this object, um, it actually can't really tell that this object is still, and it is in motion, it's going to seem like this object is in motion and it is sitting still, okay? But that is only a perception and that is only true of the Doppler shift, okay? The do uh, this guy is going to see this guy's red shifted and this guy is going to see this guy's red shifted, but uh, the relativity factor is not 
going to be the same. It's not reciprocal. And so this, again, I think is where relativity, where people are um, perceiving relativity wrong and thinking that this guy is, sees this red shifted and this guy sees this red shifted, sh red shifted. Yes, this is true, but only this only applies to the normal Doppler shift. It does not apply to the relativ relativistic um, clock retardation. The only guy whose clock is retarding is the guy, the object in motion. Okay, and so here are the equations um, related to this uh, motion. You've got the relativistic redshift for the object in stillness. Okay, you've got the Doppler redshift for an object in stillness, which is this, this factor here. You've got the, so, and for the guy on the right, you've got the relativistic blue shift for an object in motion, RBM, which is this factor here. And you have the Doppler redshift for an object in motion, which is this formula here. And so uh, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, the relativistic redshift um, Doppler equation for an object not in motion is the inverse of the relativistic equation for um, from the perspective of, of an object in motion. So these are the inverses of each other, right? Okay, and but the Doppler shift uh, works a little differently. Um, yes, they are inverses of each other, but um, uh, from the perspective of this object here, okay, there is going to be a red shift, but you have to use this formula. And from the perspective of the moving object, there is a, also a Doppler red shift, but you have to use this formula. Okay, so this formula is similar to what we saw in uh, a previous video where they're showing um, this equation for the Doppler shift, but it was inverse from what I expected. And this is because this is the equation you use for the object, object in motion. And this is a, a red shift because one over V minus C is going to create a smaller number. And when you multiply that by the frequency, you're going to get a sm um, smaller frequency, which is a Doppler red shift. Okay, the frequency is going to be less than what what uh, what uh, is being emitted. Okay, so um, so that is why you can't just write one formula. But what you can do in this case is when the object is moving away from another object, you can use this formula for both. Okay, both of both observers can use this formula if one object is moving away from another object. Uh, this times this is equal to this times this is equal to that. Okay, these are all equivalent. And so in terms of remembering a formula, uh, this is actually much easier to um, remember. You know that it's C minus V on top and C plus V on bottom. This is going to create a smaller number, which is going to create a lower frequency, which is a, um, which is a red shift. So this is going to, in general, create a red shift for both cases. So this works in both cases. I know it does because I wrote the program and I could see that in all these cases I was getting the same frequency. And so if I take a frequency and multiply it by this times this, and or I take a frequency and I multiply it by this times this, and or I take a frequency and multiply it by this, I get the same value. So now I'm just going to have a, a closer look at my codes here because this is what I'm going to put into my specification. RRS stands for relativity redshift for motion for the um, object in stillness. RBM stands for relativity blue shift for the object in motion relative to an object in stillness. DRS stands for Doppler redshift for an object in stillness. And DRM stands for Doppler redshift for the object in motion. Oh, and one more. DBS stands for Doppler blue shift for an object in stillness. And DBM stands for Doppler blue shift for the object and mo in motion. And so finally, I'm going to, uh, I, I reworked my specification again, and I separated out 
uh, relativity and the Doppler equations. But these are all of them. These are all of them. There's no other ones. This is all we need to do. Everything to do with frequency actually is in this specification now. And so if it's relativity only, which it is actually in this case here, when there's no uh, Doppler shift, when there's no normal Doppler shift, then you just use the relativity equations. And when there's also a Doppler shift, you also have to apply um, these equations. And so this pretty much covers all the ways that um, relatively, re relativity and Doppler uh, interact with each other. There is also the C minus V, uh, square root of C minus V over C plus V, and the square root of um, C plus V minus V, but those are only for the cases where uh, an object is moving towards you and not in a transverse fashion, and when an object is moving away from you uh, and not in a transverse fashion. And by transverse fashion, I am talking about um, this kind of motion here where you have an object and a another object moving past it. And that case is a little more complex. I'm not going to deal with it uh, in this video, but uh, I wanted to um, deal with all the equations that um, can be used. All the other cases are going to use uh, these, uh, cr these correction factors in some way, shape, or form. And so um, this is pretty much everything I need to, to get the job done. And so this is um, quantifying relativity. This is how I quantify relativity. Uh, to recap, I listed all the ways that objects can move relative to each other. I wrote uh, relativistic equations um, that cover all those cases. And now I am going through each case I went through the static case, I went through the rotational case, I went through the object moving towards an object and an object moving um, away from an object. And um, there are other cases, but these are the ones, these are the ones that cause confusion. Again, I want to emphasize and re-emphasize that um, most, there are no paradoxes in this. There are no paradoxes in relativity. There are no paradoxes in Doppler physics. Okay, if an object is moving away from another object, they're both going to see a redshift. But only the object that is in motion experiences clock retardation. And when that clock, when that object is trying to look at or match its clock with an object that's not moving, it is going to see the object that is not moving as blue shifted a uh, little bit. And the, the object that is not in motion is going to see the object in motion um, as a little bit red shifted. And so uh, all of these equations, all of these equations, where am I? There we go. All of these equations cover all of those circumstances. And for the more complex motions, such as objects uh, where both objects in motion, that becomes a little more complicated, uh, but you can't do any of those situations unless you have a solid foundation on, um, uh, on, this, on the condition where one object is in motion and one object is not in motion. And so uh, hopefully this, this helps, hopefully this helps. I think I'm fine tuning this specification very nicely. Almost everything I need to do uh, physics, at least in the frequency domain, is in this cheat sheet, this page right here. So that's all I'm going to do for now. I hope, uh, again, I hope you're having a great day and um, I'll be back.